University in Charleston, Illinois. Now, when I was hired here 16, 17 years ago, I didn't know where Charleston, Illinois, in the world. And that was one of the questions uh, that the committee asked me. Have you heard about this? How did you hear about it? I said, honestly, I have never heard about Charleston, Illinois. <laughs> so they laughed at me and said, well, if you work on your geography and history, because this is a place that you want to know its history and geography. The nice thing is that they hired me and they kept me. So uh, I say this because maybe this video will be uh, a broadcast uh, over the internet and people wouldn't know where Charles Illinois is, but please believe me, it is a wonderful place to be at. And I welcome you to the first Eastern Illinois University uh, Symposium on Science and Technology. And Dr. Da uh, Stephen Daniels and I, Dr. Stephen Daniels, the chair of the physics department, who is joining hands with me to do this, we wish that this wouldn't be the last, it would be the first in a series of Symposium, and we are grateful for the, uh, almost 50 presenters uh, I mean, from a variety of topics that are giving us their hearts and their minds to share with, uh, with us. So uh, without much ado, uh, Revolutions in Science and Technology Paradigms is the symposium. And Dr. Ping Lu is my friend and colleague, uh, whom I learned a lot from him through these years. Yes. And uh, without much ado, I'll uh, give the microphone to him. And please join with me in welcoming. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wabi. And uh, we appreciate that when we look at the program, I was so impressed that you are able to pull all the kind of talents together. And I cannot claim myself as talent, but I, I feel that uh, it's an honor to be a, with this, uh, this business group. So, And then uh, my talk will be kind of illustrating the things how we did in the past was, uh, across the entire campus and then how, what we are doing right now and uh, where we are heading towards in the future in terms of clean energy research and education across uh, the entire campus here. So it will be very simple. My, my idea initially was that I will use those slides as a clue for conversation. And I personally, I don't like lecture, so I don't do a lecture and I don't, I don't do lecture well anyway. So but, uh, I want to use those slides as a kind of a lead for conversation for us. Okay, so. And uh, we all of us know that uh, Eastern Illinois Uni University has uh, constructed our renewable energy center. We replaced the old steam plant and to supply supplies the steam and the heat and some electricity to the, to the whole campus. And so it used to be the steam plant was uh, close to Old Main, but now it's on the far edge of the campus. I was told that back to the 1920s, and before probably Dr. Bohalu was born, <laughs> that uh, the old steam plant was at the edge of the campus at that moment. So you can see over about 80 some years, maybe more than 80 years, then the, the campus has grown quite a bit. So hopefully that new spot will not be the edge in, near, in, the, in the future anyway. So, but with this kind of construction that uh, uh, the university felt that, or community felt that uh, there were there are opportunities present for our academic uh, units here. So there was, a back to about uh, spring of 2010, there was a directive from the president and the provost saying, well, we need to integrate the opportunities brought by the Renewable Energy Center with our educational mission. That's what the pro president and provost was, have been talking about, so-called integrated learning. And they want to really push that. And so I, for some odd reasons, I don't know, and uh, I was involved. And so I sit in the meetings and uh, listen to the talks, and then I sense the passion from the, the president and, and the provost. And then I sense also the kind of, kind of some kind of uh, uh, passion also from our faculty and the chairs and the deans. You know. But anyway, that the, the challenge there was that uh, how do we systematically integrate the student learning process with those opportunities brought by the Renewable Energy Center? Right now, it seems to be a very easy question, but at that moment, it was really a kind of, a, not debate, but it was kind of a things that we don't know what we, are to, what we, what we want to do. So eventually, that uh, uh, the campus came together I mean, mainly College of Sciences, because almost all the meetings were hosted by in the College of Science Dean's office. 
And I was from, I was from College of Business and Applied Sciences, and I just don't know what's going on. But as a faculty member in your department, for example, uh, Dr. Chris Langan has been participating in a, in a meeting. And then your former chair, Dr. Stemek, and then he, before he moved to uh, this, uh, the uh, Honors College, and he was also part of that meeting process. And your dean, Dean Hanner, and our dean, Dean uh, Holdley, they were all in that meeting with provost. And many, after several, several meetings there, and then there was a kind of consensus that uh, the whole campus needs to form a cohesive effort and concerted effort in the sense to kind of integrate the, the opportunity we have on this campus. So, so that was a concept evolved, and the concept eventually evolved uh, this, this uh, uh, thing we call the Center for Clean Energy Research and Education. And I had a hard time to come, uh, come up with an acronym, but, acronym, but uh, uh, Mary Hanton Perry, and she's a, she's a, well, she has a PhD in English, and, uh, she said, well, we can, you can do this. It's OK. You don't need to use uh, all the first letters. So eventually, we came up with a name called Sincere. And it's easy to us to pronounce and easy to, to, for, us, for us to use. But also, it captured the spirit for the whole campus to work together. So that, to me, that works both ways, either correct or not. But uh, it works together to pull all the efforts together across the entire campus. So with the education, research and education mission, I'll start with the education uh, component, see what we did and how, we, uh, how that evolves. So, so the first thing that uh, Sincere has started support, supporting is the development of uh, an undergraduate concentration. And eventually, it was called Alternative Energy and Sustainability. And that's a concentration under our Applied Engineering and Technology undergraduate major in the school of technology. Okay, so any questions so far at this point? Okay, no, it's a pretty simple concept, but, but when you look at the back, you'll see we have gone through a lot of details. So, so, and, then, and then we put the efforts there and then to develop a, we call interdisciplinary minor. That's a minor between College of Sciences and the College of Business and Applied Sciences. So basically what we did was we, Pour some courses, or I should not say we, but the main efforts were, were done by Dr. Gaines and Dr. Langan in your department. And putting those efforts to say, pour the courses for the AET concentration, uh, alternative energy and uh, sustainability, and with some biological science courses and geology, geography courses, and uh, political science, economic courses together to make a interdisciplinary minor. Okay. That effort was a kind of concurrent effort as we developed for another a new graduate degree program called the uh, Master of Science in Sustainable Energy. So, and this was uh, uh, a developer based upon the work and experience we have enjoyed so much working with different people, different faculty members, students across the different departments. Uh, and so this is a, a, a now becomes a reality that uh, initially our thought was to. Uh, pull all the efforts together for the, for the entire campus to make this a, as a reality. The reason we did this was that uh, back to early 2010, I happened to, went to, happened to be on a seminar at uh, Millica University in Decatur. And the guest speaker was uh, uh, the director of uh, Henry Ford uh, Presidential Library. And he was asked to serve as a commission for the BP oil spill investigation. And so, so he was very familiar with that uh, investigation issues and, and, the, and basically related to energy and the environment issues. So. And he made a very indelible kind of uh, impression on me because in that speech he mentioned that uh, in order for us to solve energy pro problems, and we got to work together, we got to pull all the talents uh, from different uh, sectors. And he was, he really, literally me government agencies, uh, communities, and different uh, kind of disciplines. And, yeah. and then, so that, 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 that kind of speech uh, gave, gave me a kind of impression that I, uh, we will need to work together to, with other people to come up with a solution. And sure enough, after I, I, I have done some research and found out really, indeed, any of those problems are no longer a simple problem. So probably Dr. Craig can mention that, can, can testify that, like, just like a weather condition, that it's so complex. And a, person, a single person probably can no longer tackle a, this, this complex issue effectively anymore. So we need a kind of collective efforts to 
for people to work together. So anyway, uh, this here, uh, this program as we develop it there, and it, it evolves, and the concept we had was that this degree being Eastern, being at EIU, our niche is not the same as your wife. Your wife being, for example, being a research institution, and they can produce lots of bench, like we call bench scientists. But being a liberal arts foundational school, now our niche is to provide students with a technical skills or, or knowledge, at the same time providing a kind of a long-term kind of people skills as well. So it's a good combination of people skills and the technical know-how in the sense that makes our students marketable in, in, the, in the competitive world. So the, this program design was, was based on what we call science-based and then management focused. So those two combined together. So we hope that will make students very, very marketable. Because uh, as I talked to Mike uh, before this meeting here, that and I, I feel that uh, if we want to be valuable to an organization, and we got to be able to work with different people, we, we need to understand the technical details, but also we need to find ways to be able to work with other people. That way we can make a bigger impact for the organization or eventually for the society. So, so basically what we had was that, uh, so there's a whole cluster of uh, science courses in the program. So th those were delivered by, say, physics, chemistry, biological science, and then uh, technology. And then there, there is, there's another cluster of uh, technology management courses. And those were de delivered by technology and the business. And then for, for our stu students to be a leader in the future, they have to be able to communicate, and be, work with, be able to work with other people. So that's why you can see uh, English and uh, uh, political science, uh, English and the communication studies. They are also part of that, uh, that, 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 that program. They provide a course on communication studies in the technical field, disciplines. And then we have to also understand the political, it's geopolitical and, and those kind of issues there. So that's why we have geology, geography, economics, and political science that deals with one cluster, um, I call it policy and economics cluster. Yeah, so, so you have several clusters in, in, that, in that whole, whole uh, degree program. We hope that uh, students will be able to uh, develop their niche when, before they graduate. And then this degree program is uh, under sincere, and uh, so it's, it heavily focuses on research, but also it provides the students a required practical experience to be done at a renewable energy center. And this is something that's very unique uh, in this country, that uh, if you look at, for example, uh, any med uh, medical school, for example, all the medical schools have their own teaching hospitals. But on the other hand, if you look at any college of engineering or college of sciences, you probably don't have any practice in factories or you don't have any practice in companies in your, in your, on your campus. But with the Renewable Energy Center here being present on campus, uh, being utilized here for this degree, then students will be able to do their practical job shadowing within that facility. So that becomes our teaching laboratory in a sense, a teaching factory in a sense. And so, so that becomes a very unique feature for this new degree program. Okay, so any questions? Any comments? And we also will have a new building. At this yes, that's coming up. I will talk a little bit on that. That will present some new opportunities uh, for our faculty and students. As a matter of fact, how many, any of, did any of you attend the faculty reception yesterday by the president and the provost, faculty senate. Okay. And the president spent quite a bit of effort, uh, quite time talking about sincere building yesterday. And he mentioned about the idea that uh, we, EIU has created the Renewable Energy Center and the Renewable Energy Center has brought many opportunities for us. So, so this, is, this, this kind of is a more elaborate version of uh, his uh, talk uh, yesterday, talking about the sincere part. So, but I'll, I'll get to that, that, uh, uh, that portion for the sincere building. So thank you, Dr. Pohalu. Okay. So currently we have, uh, uh, with this effort, we have uh, several research efforts concurrently going with sincere and with other faculty members across the entire campus. So, and so this is a biomass education research project. It's a project funded by the National Science Foundation. It's a three-year project. And so, so that 
that this is, we are not in the middle of that uh, project of well not. Okay, so, and what you have seen is this is a biomass gas gasifier that converts a biomass, like for example, wood chips or say grass pellets into uh, syngas that contains uh, carbon monoxide, hydrogen, and then methane gas. So, so, and then that's the, the same type of mechanism that you will see in the renewable energy center. Over there, there are two major gasifiers that, that can convert, uh, say, uh, wood chips into energy, and then you burn the energy to generate uh, steam and partial electricity for the campus. So, so we hope that uh, we can use that. The, the main, well, by the way, that the gasifier was, was purchased with a support from Charleston Area Charitable Foundation. And the reason EIU was able to secure the funding initially was that uh, uh, we want to study different biomass of stocking, stocks, and hopefully we'll find alternatives for the renewable energy center. And then with that solution there, we hope that we can promote farmers in this region to grow energy crops. Okay, or some other, we can, we, can, we, can, we can also get some energy from the crop residuals, for example, corn store will be one example, to get those energy out of uh, the uh, residuals from the agricultural process. So, okay. so we, our hope is to kind of use the renewable energy center at the EIU as an economic engine to drive this whole region. So, so this is a, a second, the other project funded by uh, URI's uh, Illinois Sustainable Technology Center that deals with uh, uh, grass pallets gasification process. It's a, a further step of uh, our project from the National Science Foundation. And what we do on this here is that we deal with uh, grass pallets like miscanthus and switchgrass and make, the pallet, make them into pallets and then, and then see how we can gasify them in, and then to, to uh, rip the energy value from the process. So, okay. And then look at the, uh, the energy production, and we always have to look at the systematic way, or a kind of a sustainable way to, 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 to continuously uh, sustain the operation. So the gasification is one part of the, the game. The other thing we have been looking at is that uh, the Dr. Wabi is also in this project. That this is a way of looking at how do we dispose the ash, and how do we utilize the ash coming out of wood, of wood chips or other biomass. So, even though, for example, the emission of using utilizing biomass is much much lower than than coal combustion, coal has a very high content of silicon oxide and then calcium oxide. And so because of that, the ash content is much higher than biomass. Biomass has much lower count, content on that. However, regardless how small it is, but over the years, you're gonna generate some biomass ash. For example, the capacity designed for the renewable energy center here at EIU is uh, uh, we are gonna consume 30,000 tons of, uh, of uh, biomass every year. 30,000 tons is not a very small number. And if you look at a very low concentration of uh, ash, for example, if you take 1% as one example, then you're talking about 3,000 uh, 30, yeah, 3, tons of ash. And uh, 3,000 tons of ash may not be very huge, but if you look at the cost for dispose to landfill, in average, is about $85 per ton. And so you still have to pay for those if we don't have found ways to dispose them in a responsible way because we want, we want to do it anyway. We want, to, we want to do it in a sustainable and responsible way to dispose of those, of those uh, uh, ash there. So one of the ways we have, this also the project was also sponsored by Illinois Sustainable Technology Center at URI, is that we are looking at the ash, how we can add those ash as an additives to make concrete uh, structure materials. For example, it could, could be a brick Actually, this is a, a research project is collaborating with the ISTC people there, and ISTC staff are doing applications for brick structures. So we are doing cement applications. So we are kind of those two teams converge our thoughts and our findings together. Then the main purpose is to find applications for for gas, again, biomass gas ashes. Okay. 
So that's another review of uh, practical application for the, the projects we have. So those three projects are all funded by different agencies and for for sincere. And, and then and now in the process we also were able to involve undergraduate students in, as part of the research and because I, I can see this is a not, not only Eastern but also a national movement that all the colleges are putting a lot of emphasis on undergraduate research because that will make our student, undergraduate students much, much more marketable in competing for graduate school or competing for professional schools or even some the, the jobs in the marketplace. So, so this is a one example that we are able to involve undergraduate students for the research. I'm glad that Mike is doing that and, and for your research. It's an excellent thing to do. Okay, very smart move. And the other thing that uh, is that we not only have for support from different fund agencies uh, outside the university, but also we partner with uh, different, say, private companies. And so this is one example that uh, we partner with a company that working, we work with on uh, recycled wood. And how do we convert the recycled wood into a useful form? So in this particular case, we try to use, use them to kind of hammer mill and grind them into small pieces before we make a wood pallets. Okay. So the next picture you will see those are the wood pallets made by those uh, graduate students' team. And so then, then we can gasify those, put into the uh, gasifier and convert them into gas. Okay. If we don't do it, then the, the question why do we do it is that uh, if we don't do it, and then the, the material you have or the fuel you have is not going to be very consistent, and then you can, it's not easy for you to control the gasification process. In theory, we could do it, we can gasify whatever carbonaceous material we have, but it's not easy for us to control. It's not going to give you the efficiency, so it's not going to be practical if, if we don't have a consistent form of uh, the fuel. So, any question on this? Um, I yes, wonder great. if I can, uh, if this might relate, because um, I know one of the uh, things that I've been hearing the questions is um, how we get past some of the difficulties in obtaining or using materials like corn stove that mm -hmm. you mentioned. Yes. Can you talk about what some of those issues are? Yes. Yeah, uh, we have, uh, uh, just last semester, we have studied uh, a plant called Arundo Donex. Uh, Arundo Donex, if you, I, I'm not a biolo biologist, but we look at the kind of shapes there. They are very similar to miscanthus, but much, much bigger and more like a bamboo. Okay. The reason I want to mention that is that uh, uh, we simply chop those uh, around the donuts and put them in the gasifier, and uh, marginally we could gasify them. However, it's going to be and uh, the control was much much more difficult, much tricky, and the combustion process happening in the gasifier is more violent in a sense. So the long story short, to answer your question, the, the, first of all, there is one technical issue that is the consistency. If I collect the corn store, for example, after we chop them, and you see leaves, you see stems, you see cobs, and all different things come together, and there are different forms. The leaves are much, much more difficult for us to control in terms of internal, in the, in the combustion process. In classification needs some combustion. So it's very difficult to control that combustion process to make it steady. So I would imagine that uh, we have, it's not conclusive yet, but I would imagine that we need to form some kind of either pallets or bucket before we can practically uh, gasify them in a meaningful way. Okay, so that's number one thing. The other challenge we noticed this, uh, this semester because the project we deal with on switchgrass and is that uh, chemically the composition of uh, corn store is very, very similar to switchgrass and miscanthus in many senses. And the main thing I want to re mention that is that uh, uh, it has very high content of chlorine and also very high content of uh, sodium and potassium. And those, as a result of those uh, chemical elements there, that you, you, you will be able to, you will see what we call slag happen in the gasification process. What will happen is that eventually they will build up and you'll see some kind of a slag and the slag will form if, if you don't have, if, you, if your sodium and, and the potassium content is very low and the slag you form is going to be very loose, 
But if, because the sodium and the, and the, and the potassium content there, and there, they are going to form with the calcium oxide, form what we call low melting point eutectoid kind of chemical compound. In other words, they, they will be melted, and then they will they will form, they will kind of solidify together. It's like a sintering process. If you look at the geological kind of formation, it's like a sintering process. They sinter together and they form clumps inside the, the gasifier. And that will cause us some problems with the, the actual equipment. And that will be an inherited, uh, prob inherited problem that for with the uh, application of any grasses we will, will deal with. But there, there will be solutions. We need to find a solution to how, how we make it, how we neutralize, for example, the potassium and then the sodium and chloride effects. So that will, those will be the technical issues I think we will need to, 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 uh, to deal with. The other practical issue that is that uh, uh, corn store is uh, scattered around in the whole region. And then for renewable energy, if you have, you spent, let's just say, one million BTU of uh, energy, and then you rip only half a million BTU, and it's not worth it. So, so in other words, there's a, a energy harvesting and a transportation issue. What it boils down, it will be a practical supply chain management issues. And those are the issues that I, th I think is very, very critical for economics folks and for business folks to be able to tackle that issue. To me, probably that will be much, much more challenging. And people have been doing this. For example, um, DuPont has just started a uh, ethanol plant in Story City, I Iowa, which is uh, about 10 miles uh, west, west of uh, Ames, Iowa. And the reason I knew it was because I graduated from Iowa State and I knew their story. But, but anyway, at, uh, DuPont is, from, has, is constructing a plant there that converts, for, converts corn stover into ethanol. And so they, are started, they have started uh, setting up their supply chain around the Story City area in, in, in Iowa. But that can be done in the, in the future. It, it is a challenge there, but it can be done. And in this area, for example, if you go to Decatur, A.E. Staley and ADM, they have been doing this for their soybeans for, for many, many years. But it will be something similar because agriculture is on an annual basis. And you, every year, you only will have one or twice. In this, in this area, only once harvest time. In other, other areas for rice, probably you, you can have it twice. But for this area, it basically it's once, once, once per year type of deal. Then you have to find story, ways to store them and process them. And those are all the technical as well as the business challenges still. Okay. There are a lot of challenges. It can be done, but, I just, but there are, it's not easy to say, well, we can do it tomorrow. But it takes us some time, it takes some collective efforts. So. That is one of the, another example that I will see that it takes a lot of efforts from different people to tackle different issues. So, I know in your department, Chris, Dr. Langan has been working on the uh, coastal hey, issues. Peter, I have a question. Is the composition, uniformity of composition, and uniformity of size, size of this, is all critical as important? Composition, uniformity of composition, and yes. uniformity of size. Yes. All they are. And uh, in, in theory, if you look at the chemical reaction equation there, you can, carbon, you can, you can gasify anything, carbonaceous. As long as it has, car has carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in that, you can, you can do it. However, as I mentioned, that you will not be able to control in a consistent manner if they don't have the consistent form. Yes. There will be much, that's one of the beauty of uh, the petroleum, for example, at this moment. Because everything we got, they are very, very consistent. The sad thing is, however, is that they only can, based upon the current estimate, we can only have uh, probably about 40 to 50 year, more years of, uh, of a petroleum reserve on Earth for based upon the current consumption rate. Not, how, not talking about the increased consumption rate in the near future. So. After 40 years, and then I will probably, I'll be, I will be somewhere else. But yeah. my kids probably will still face more challenges there after 40 years. But, but, but that's the reason that I think uh, uh, across the entire U.S., if you look at all the colleges there, all the universities are doing something similar to the green or, or renewable energy thing because that represents the future. And our 
And I can see probably from conversation with Mike, I can see that uh, his generation is much, much more forward thinking than my generation. And my generation, I think, is better than my parents. But you will, you will see that the next generation will be much, much more forward thinking than Mike's generation. The point I want to make is that, uh, you know, I, I'm, I run two graduate programs, and we, we are pretty lucky that we are able to attract student interest. But for, from a university perspective, and we got to be able to think at least in the synchronization with our next generations. Not, not mentioning about leading, leading for our next generations and next, next. But of course, the university are supposed to lead our next generations. So this is one example that in terms of a forward thinking, a forward looking type of a mentality, and this is what represents EIU as a forward thinking institution in that image there. So I think that there are a lot of implications, a lot of things that probably longer term wise, uh, thinking that more important than I can imagine from a purely technical aspect, because this has a long term impact for uh, the university's health in terms of our ways of thinking for future. So, <laughs> all right. So this is a kind of uh, the research activities we can see you now across the entire campus, surrounded with uh, renewable uh, energy type of activities. And Mike has work, has been working with Dr. Cannon, for example. And he has been dealing with the fungi and, and, and then treatment for, for, for biomass. How can we make this more kind of uh, more e easier to, to palletize and then to make it uh, uh, more treatable and more conducive? Okay, so that it all boils down later on eventually to consistency and, and uniformity in the, in, the, in the future. And Dr. Gio Deppi in biological science has been studying animal ecological systems and the impact of, uh, say, ded dedicated energy crops on ecological systems. And Dan Johnson has been working on uh, biodiesel. And Dr. Bless in chemistry has, has been working with us on the gasification chemistry, particularly looking at uh, the uh, gas chemi chemical kinetics, and for example, the temperature effect on the production of gas with the grasses, uh, grasses uh, switchgrass, uh, miscanthus, those type of uh, uh, grass biomass. And a new faculty for chemistry, Dr. He, Hanson Ho, he deals with more organic solar cells. And so it's a different front. And then Dr. Gopal Periana working on microbial and, microbial and, and energy conversion. And his specialty is in the, from, from, from sugar to uh, energy cons conversion there. So, and then Dr. Clapp uh, in biology and Dr. Karen Gaines in uh, biological science, they have been working on biochar in terms of the analysis of the chemical composition of the biochar and then long term impact on the ecological systems, and the toxicity uh, of the biochar on, in the ecological systems. Okay, so those are the kind of current activities, and we, we, we certainly we have more, many, many more, but I just list those as one example for the things going on on campus. So. Okay. And then currently, another thing I want to mention to you also that is that. Uh, uh, I talked to Mike on this here. That currently, we we have started this semester to invite uh, Charleston High School students to participate in our research activities, work interacting with our undergraduate, graduate students, and the faculty member. And for this is an initiative, uh, kind of uh, started by Provost. And back to about two two and a half years ago, Provost had a meeting with the school district uh, uh, super, assistant superintendents and several teachers. The idea initially was to kind of bridge between EIU and the, and the school district and see how we can collaborate, develop a collaboration, how we can support each other. But it evolves that uh, we, we find out that uh, the, if we can do it in a systematic way, and Eastern will have a real good conduit to channel young students' interests from the whole region, and then to in go into science, technology, engineering, and the mathematics area. So, so this here, we start with very small. We only have three uh, Charleston High School students now this semester working with us on renewable energy issues. And, and the interesting that uh, Mrs. Easter, she's a science teacher. She, she is so, so active and so enthusiastic, and she wants to come. So she came with uh, those three, three students every Wednesday morning and to our facility. And so this has been very, very stimulating for me. That, uh, and I use that model for 
I borrowed the idea from Stanford University for their MBA program. And they, they had a kind of informal gathering every Friday afternoon after, after they finish all the classes and they gather together. And they may drink some wine or something, but we don't have any wine and cheese. But I just uh, have an activity and organize everybody and, and, then, and then participate. The idea is to kind of talk to each other in a little informal way and then so that we can stimulate more thinking and then generate new ideas. So, so far it has been working very well for us. Okay, so hopefully we, we hope we have more departments and more, more colleges doing that in the future, collaborating with our regional and, and, and uh, uh, so different schools in the region. So this is my hope. And I'm hoping that it will generate some momentum. Okay. So anyway, that uh, the Early version EIU had, and it was articulated by the president uh, back to 2011, was that uh, EIU wants to become a biomass go-to location or go-to place. And uh, he articulated, articulated his, this version back to that fall of 11 in his uh, speech to the faculty there. So, and uh, this vision has become Closer to closer to the reality, especially as Dr. Dr. Bahalu mentioned about the building, you see that it's coming coming to uh, to reality. Now this is the, the part that if you overlook from this side, overlook the renewable energy center, and the one thing I want to mention, uh, the thing I want to mention that is that uh, altogether this whole area north of a renewable energy center, there's a there are about 13 acres of land. And the intention the university has is that this will be dedicated for renewable energy type of activity. Okay, so out of the 13 acres on this side, on the west side of this land, Dr. Cannon has got four acres. So he has planted uh, uh, miscanthus, poplar trees, and I think something else. Do you remember what he was talking about? Uh, just remember the miscanthus. Yeah, so maybe switchgrass, I think. <clears throat> I know one acre of switchgrass, one acre of uh, uh, miscanthus, and two acres of uh, fast-growing poplar trees. And so, <clears throat> but anyway, that's, so these four acres are here. And then what do we do with the rest of it? We hope that uh, we will expand the, the operation to grow more different plants as a energy uh, co-op type of experiment plot. And then also north of this area, in this area here, and we are, there's a construction going on right now. And we hope that will become a nuclear, nuclear eye for the whole campus. So, so the groundbreaking for that construction for the building uh, start, uh, happened on March the 1st this year. And the physical activity, I think the construction probably did not start until sometime in June in this year. But the president was talking about the funding possibility yesterday. And uh, so he mentioned that uh, the past uh, funding crisis, the state uh, problems delay funding. For EIU actually created some opportunity that enable EIU to allocate some internal resources to for the construction of the the, uh, the sincere building, and also the president was able to secure three hundred thousand uh, dollars, one third of the cost for Charleston area charitable foundation because our intention to interact with uh, local school districts and those kind of uh, serving community and those kind of needs there are the things we are going to, to be engaged so. But anyway, that's also one third of the cost is coming from the Charleston Area Charitable Foundation. The, the construction, this is a picture I took uh, about one week ago. And the, the, this is the site of the construction right now for the, uh, for the sincere building. So very, very, not very big, but uh, we hope it will become a nuclear for the, the campus. Maybe hopefully some other wealthy individuals can donate more, more funding and give us more support. But the, the idea is that uh, we can connect with the Renewable Energy Center as our major, major kind of uh, motivation for research and then perform, conduct research and then and do some other things within that facility. Okay, so here's the, the, the kind of layout plan for that building. And here on the north side is going to be what we call processing and gasification area. And then this area will be required an analytical laboratory. So basically you will be able to process different biomass and then analyze the chemical composition, the input, and the output, and those kind of things there okay, for gasification research. 
And then this area, one third of the uh, footage space we, we allocate there uh, is what we call ideal incubator. And at this moment, the, the major vision we had was that uh, we want to involve our students. And then we want to involve the pri private sectors in this region. And this is similar to the ideal incubators that happened in uh, Silicon Valley in California. And Stanford has played a very instrumental role in early back to the 60s. But we hope that uh, this can become a nuclear in this region and hopefully, eventually, that host the whole area will become a we call energy prairie for, uh, for the state. But the idea here is that we want to invite private companies here to set up their operation. We want our students who, who are entrepreneurs and there to work with different people and develop their ideas there, there associated with energy or bioenergy bio and uh, some other uh, productions there. Okay, so this is the kind of mission we have. We want to be able to outreach different uh, uh, the, the entire community uh, as just probably say the entire region in a sense uh, so. so so with that with that building we hope we not only are able to do research educating our students and our learning for our students learn the renewable energy concept and practices but also we want to be able to reach uh, uh, the the region yeah. so those are the activities we did, we plan to do when not uh, actually those the Teachers Institute on Renewable Energy and the summer camp for high school students, and those are actually all part of our National Science Foundation uh, project, and it's going to be part of that. It's going to take place uh, next uh, summer. Hopefully, we'll be able to do it over there. If not, we can do it in Clem Hall. So it depends on, so we don't have pressure on that. So, any questions? Comments? Okay, so that's all I have. So, this is the the commercial side for Sincere, but we do have a website and just type energy, and then you will get uh, to that website. So, thank you, thank you very much. Any questions? Yeah, Saberi. I think this is really exciting, and I know in my own class as a student, you're absolutely right, generations are, mm -hmm. are changing, and, and this, the, the young students are very interested in renewable energy. Yeah. Um, Definitely, we're in an area where biofuels uh, are at an advantage. Mm -hmm. But um, the other uh, energy source that's really growing in Illinois right now is wind. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have a group in uh, my GIS class right now looking yeah. at a, um, a wind energy project. I was just wondering what you thought the, the role of, the, of a university like EIU might be, mm -hmm. or of Sincere, in looking at other sources such as wind. Yeah. Certainly, sincere. Uh, with a sincere as a vision that we do not want to limit ourselves in biomass only, and we will be open, for, say, for research. We need more people to do those. And uh, for example, we have one faculty member in technology, Dr. Slavin. He has been working on wind aspect, and then also we have our faculty devoting efforts on solar energy as well. So those are all part of the spectrum and. Uh, in the, in the energy, uh, for the energy problems, there's no panacea on that one, one pill can solve all the problems. No. The, it really depends on a we call spectrum of solutions. So wind will be, will be a, uh, a, in a sense, wind will be part of our interest. However, though, if you look at the landscape in the state of Illinois, and we did not start with wind, the reason is that uh, if, if you look at the landscape, if you look, go to southern Illinois, Carbondale has been known for their coal research in the country. U of I, north of us, has been known for their research uh, for ethanol production, in a sense, because they have an agriculture college, and then so ever since they have uh, the college there, and they, they have people who deal with food sciences, and then they eventually do ethanol and those kind of production. Yeah. And then uh, on the western side, and we don't have much going on, but Illinois State University, and they started earlier than us. And so they formed a, they call a Center for Renewable Energy. And so because of the McLean County there, you see this, there are, I think at least I know there are two visible wind farms, not very far from Bloomington normal area. So they use that as their niche. And so, so, so at this moment, at this moment, I don't see any companies setting up a wind farm 
south of Charleston because the geological forms are different. It's not, not as flat. And so, so, so I can see that uh, we, there's no reason for us to compete with uh, Illinois State looking at, uh, for example, on the wind. But I don't think they really, they, 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 they got much into that either because they, once the wind farm is established, there's not much you can do. But, but, but they are closer to that, and so they, they, start, they tend to study more. I know Dr. David Loomis, he's a, a, he's a director over there for their Center for Renewable Energy Center, and Center for Renewable Energy. And uh, he's an econ economist, and he, he deals with quite a bit of uh, kind of a study in early years, maybe back to four or five years ago, dealing with more, say, the feasibility of a wind in that, that region and in, in the whole state of Illinois. So, so to, to answer your question, that we have interest in, but I don't see us developing a good niche right away. It may take some time. It may, it may be never happen, but, uh, but certainly if I'm looking at the energy perspective or spectrum perspective, energy, uh, wind energy and solar will be to our interest. Yeah, so. Uh, this should be very interesting to international students, especially Asian mm -hmm. countries, yes. to bring this, this from here. Yes, yes. Yeah, it takes some time for them to know the programs. Uh, for example, that uh, in the graduate programs I, do, I manage are called Master of Science in Technology. And this program, then the, altogether now we have uh, 171 students this semester. And we have about, ni about 90 international students. And many of them knew the program through, for, for knew the program because we have a component called computer technology. Because they came to US looking for computer technology programs. And so that, I'm hoping that the sustainable energy program eventually will establish, will establish ourselves in terms of name and reputation, and students will come, will come for that interest. But certainly you are right that in, especially in Asian, well I think it's actually not, not necessarily Asian countries, but also Europe and South America, many other countries are leading. And for example, the US, compared, to, compared with US, we have, we have such abundant resources. People don't really sometimes don't appreciate it. <laughs> but in other countries, barrel resources are so scarce. And so they tend to value more on those here. So they put more emphasis and more. But so those countries tend to put more, I'll say, weight on their research on renewable energy. But this becomes a, eventually, I think, will become a human survival issue. So, so eventually, we'll come, come to that point. So it will become more and more important. That's why we need to educate our new generation so, so they know. And then when they become politicians or anything, decision makers in the future, they, they can make wise decisions for the human race in general. Because I remember that uh, I, back to, you can remember those probably, I did uh, quite a bit of recycling efforts back to early 1990s on, on campus. So at that moment, just back to 20 years ago, and I, I had to, to tell you the truth on that. Recycling was a very, very new concept back to 20 years ago. But now with Mike's generation, recycling is a, it's just a routine thing for them to do or to recognize. So it takes some time for us to educate the kids and then eventually they'll become more educated and more aware of how we can protect and preserve the natural resources. So, so. Uh, I know you said that during the presentation, but what is the relationship uh, material-wise with the energy center and the sincere? I mean, I know they get their raw material mm -hmm. to do the heating and so forth. Yes. And Sincere will take the residue or what? What is the relation? Uh, that there are two major missions. That uh, the first mission we initially got was that, uh, or we sensed that uh, the renewable energy centers gasifiers and are designed to consume only wood chips. And wood chips are much more consistent in terms of energy values and the internal control. But you look at this area. This is a, as a, uh, Barry mentioned, this is an agricultural land. This is not a forestry. Mm -hmm. And if you go maybe 100 miles south of here, you go next to Shawnee National Park, maybe you're, you're okay. You will have lots of uh, forest, forestry resources. But in this region, we don't. And uh, so if, if you look at the resources in the future, and the bioresource, particularly, 
and we have to depend upon agriculture. And so in other words, we got to find some alternatives to the, the wood chips in the future. That's a long-term thing. But in order for the university to be able to position ourselves to consume, to use, say for example, corn store, we got to do some research, we got to do some testing, we got to, do, we got to find some data, we got to pull people together to make it work. So that's, a, that's really, to me, it's a very urgent thing, and even though we don't, we don't realize it, it's very urgent for us to find alternatives and to sustain the operation in, in the future. So that became, initially, that was a very, very early vision for Sincere. Let's go ahead and do some research. We cannot emulate uh, BP Amoco, for example, a big corporation, but they have a, their research and development laboratory in Naperville, in Chicago area. And this research and development will support their operations in the field, and down to Houston, or different places. So we hope that, uh, in an in initial stage, we hope that Sincere we can, can serve as a research and development arm for the university and support the real mission of the Renewable Energy Center. That was what I was first thing. And then after the Renewable Energy Center is in operation, we realized that uh, not only to support the fuel selection, but also we need to find out systematically deal with the ash, for example. And so the ash project we had is just a beginning that we need to deal with them systematically in the future, including ash and possibly in the future emission controls. So those will become a kind of research motivation for us to do. I have a question that I know that it's not us to talk about. It's mm -hmm. uh, the term renewable energy. We didn't invent that or coin it. It's just the way it is, renewable energy. But just trying to think linguistically, mm -hmm. is it the energy that's renewable or the source of energy is renewable? <laughs> energy goes. I put me a source, get energy, and energy is, is used. Oh, yes, yes, the energy doesn't uh, dissipate and uh, the law of uh, thermal matter and energy doesn't go away, I mean, just transform. But if you get some uh, source of heat, mm -hmm. the heat is energy, yeah. and the energy is used, and by by you see it, it became something else. Mm -hmm. So is it a renewable energy, or I can bring another source of energy, and that's, this is the renewable? You are absolutely right. I think. Uh, uh, if you look at this here, here, it's a source that's a renewable. And we, we can also argue that uh, even coal, petroleum, they are also renewable because they came from the biological source in, in, but in geological kind of time scale. So that's a very, very long stretch if you say it's a renewable also. But a, to, to go back to your question, it's a source that's a renewable. Sources. Yes. One of the reasons why I get this ideas in my mind is um, I see our society is, is, is uh, kind of accepting uh, the buzzwords as is. For example, we, if you say illegal immigrants, it became a uh, household uh, illegal immigrants. Mm -hmm. So when you hear that some illegal immigrants will become lawyers, yeah, okay, they practice law. I mean, why are yeah. illegal immigrants? It doesn't, they, we get numb to something. Or, oh, he died with friendly fires. Oh, oh okay. So it's, it's all right, as if it is all right to die by friend. <laughs> die, I mean, see what I mean? Yeah. This kind of. Or even just yesterday, I heard about the Church of Atheists, the Atheist Church. Mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. So, by, wh why is it that we use terms and just confuse people? Paradoxical. Call it something else. I mean. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is an example that uh, a foreigner like us pay attention to the language. I was joking with my students, for example, that I, after coaching, coaching my two younger daughter for National Spelling Bee for two years, I developed a habit that I had to, for everything I don't know, I had to look at a dictionary. Yeah. And my students don't do it. <laughs> and so when I, look at, was looking at, when I was teaching my management subject, I was asking them, what is the vision, what is the mission? And some of them don't know. I said, you look at a dictionary, you will see better if you, if you do. And so this is the thing that we actually, we, pay more attention because we don't know what, what's going on. Now you will laugh at this. Yeah. When I say six
School of Technology at Eastern Illinois University in Charleston, Illinois. Now, when I was hired here 16, 17 years ago, I didn't know where Charleston, Illinois, in the world. And that was one of the questions uh, that the committee asked me. Have you heard about this? How did you hear about it? I said, honestly, I have never heard about Charleston, Illinois. <laughs> so they laughed at me and said, well, if you work on your geography and history, because this is a place that you want to know its history and geography. The nice thing is that they hired me and they kept me. So uh, I say this because maybe this video will be uh, broadcast uh, over the internet and people wouldn't know where Charles Bernay is, but please believe me, it is a wonderful place to be at. And I welcome you to the first Eastern Illinois University uh, Symposium on Science and Technology. And Dr. Da uh, Stephen Daniels and I, Dr. Stephen Daniels, the chair of the physics department, who is joining hands with me to do this, we wish that this wouldn't be the last. It would be the first in a series of Symposium, and we are grateful for the, uh, almost 50 presenters uh, I mean, from a variety of topics that are giving us their hearts and their minds to share with, uh, with us. So uh, without much ado, uh, Revolutions in Science and Technology Paradigms is the symposium. And Dr. Ping Lu is my friend and colleague, uh, whom I learned a lot from him through these years. Yeah. And uh, without much ado, I'll uh, give the microphone to him. And please join with me in the uh, thing we call the Center for Clean Energy Research and Education. And I had a hard time to come, uh, come up with, with an acronym, but, acronym, but uh, uh, Mary Hampton Perry, and she's a, she's a, well, she has a PhD in English, and uh, she said, well, we can, you can do this. It's okay, you don't need to use uh, all the first letters. So eventually we came up with a name called Sincere. And it's easy to us to pronounce and easy to, to, for, us, for us to use. But also to capture the spirit for the whole campus to work together. So that, to me, that works both ways. You either correct or not, but uh, it works together to pull all the efforts together across the entire campus. So, so with the education, research and education mission, I'll start with the education uh, component, see what we did and how we uh, how that evolves. So. so the first thing that uh, Sincere has started support, supporting is the development of uh, an undergraduate concentration, and eventually it was called Alternative Energy and Sustainability. And that's a concentration under our Applied Engineering and Technology undergraduate major in the School of Technology. Okay, so, any questions so far at this point? Yeah, no, it's a pretty simple concept, but, but when you look at the back, you see we have gone through a lot of details. So, so, and, then, and then we put the efforts there and then to develop a, we call interdisciplinary minor. That's a minor between College of Sciences and the College of Business and Applied Sciences. So basically what we did was we put some courses, or I should not say we, but the main efforts were, were done by Dr. Gaines and Dr. Langan in your department. And putting those efforts to say, pull the courses for the AET concentration, uh, alternative energy and uh, sustainability, and with some biological science courses and geology, geography courses, and uh, political science, economic courses together to make a interdisciplinary minor. Okay. That effort was a kind of concurrent effort as we develop for another a new graduate degree program called the uh, Master of Science in Sustainable Energy. So. And this was uh, uh, a developer based upon the work and experience we have enjoyed so much working with different people, different faculty members, students across the different departments. And so this is a, a not becomes a reality that uh, initially our thought was to uh, pull all the efforts together for the, for the entire campus to make this a, as a reality. The reason we did this was that uh, back to Early 2010, I happened to, went to, happened to be on a seminar at uh, Millican University in Decatur. And the guest speaker was uh, uh, the director of uh, Henry Ford Presidential Library. And he was asked to serve as a commission for the BP oil spill investigation. And so, so he was very familiar with that uh, investigation issues and, and, the, and basically related to energy and environmental issues. So. And he made a very indelible kind of uh, impression on me because in that speech he mentioned that uh, 
in order for us to solve energy pro problems. And we got to work together. We got to pull all the talents uh, from different uh, sectors. And he was, he literally, literally mean government agencies, uh, communities, and different uh, kind of disciplines in there. And then, so that, in that, that, that kind of speech uh, gave, gave me a kind of impression I, I will need to work together to, with other people to come up with a solution. And sure enough, after I, I, I have done some research and find out really, indeed, any of those problems are no longer a simple problem. So probably Dr. Craig can mention that, can, can testify that, like just like a weather condition, that it's so complex. And a, pers a single person probably can no longer tackle a, this, this complex issue effectively anymore. So we need a, a kind of collective effort to, for people to work together. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wabi. And uh, we appreciate that when we look at the program, I was so impressed that you are able to pull all the kind of talents together. And I cannot claim myself as talent, but I, I feel that uh, it's an honor to be a, with this, uh, this business group. So, and then uh, my talk will be kind of illustrating the things how we did in the past with, uh, across the entire campus, and then how, what we are doing right now and uh, where we are heading towards in the future in terms of clean energy research and education across uh, the entire campus here. So it will be very simple. My, my idea initially was that I will use those slides as a clue for conversation. And I personally, I don't like lecture, so I don't do a lecture, and I do, don't, I do not do lecture well anyway. So but, uh, I want to use those slides as a kind of a lead for conversation for us. Okay, so. And uh, we all of us know that uh, Eastern Illinois Uni University has uh, constructed our renewable energy center. We replaced the old steam plant and to supply supplies the steam and the heat and some electricity to the, to the whole campus. And so it used to be the steam plant was uh, close to Old Main, but now it's uh, on the far edge of the campus. I was told that back to the 1920s, and before probably Dr. Buhalu was born, <laughs> that uh, the old steam plant was at the edge of the campus at that moment. So you can see over about 80 some years, maybe more than 80 years, then the, the campus has grown quite a bit. So hopefully that new spot will not be the edge in, near, in, the, in the future anyway. So, but with this kind of construction that uh, the university felt that, or community felt that uh, there were there are opportunities present for our academic uh, units here. So there was a back to about uh, spring of 2010, there was a directive from the president and the provost saying, well, we need to integrate the opportunities brought by the Renewable Energy Center with our educational mission. That's what the pro president and provost was, have been talking about, so-called integrated learning, and they want to really push that. And so I, for some odd reasons, I don't know, and uh, I was involved, and so I sit in the meetings and uh, listen to the talks, and then I sense the passion from the, the president and, and the provost, and then I sense also the kind of, kind of some kind of uh, uh, passion also from our faculty and the chairs and the deans. You know. But anyway, that the, the challenge there was that uh, how do we systematically integrate the student learning process with those opportunities brought by the Renewable Energy Center? Right now, it seems to be a very easy question, but at that moment, it was really a kind of, a, not debate, but it was kind of things that we don't know what we, are to, what we, what we want to do. So eventually, that uh, uh, the campus came together, I mean, mainly, College of Sciences, because almost all the meetings were hosted by in the College of Science Dean's office, and I was from I was from College of Business and Applied Sciences, and I just don't know what's going on. But as a faculty member in your department, for example, uh, Dr. Chris Langan has been participating in the, in that meeting, and then your former chair, Dr. Stemek, and then he before he moved to uh, this uh, the. Uh, Honors College, and he was also part of that meeting process. And your dean, Dean Hanna, and our dean, Dean uh, Holdley, they were all in that meeting with the provost. And many, after several, several meetings there, and then there was a kind of consensus that uh, the whole campus needs to form a cohesive effort 
a concerted effort in the sense to kind of integrate the, the opportunity we have on this campus. So, so that was a concept evolved, and the concept eventually evolved uh, this, this uh, 